SoFi just posted Q3 earnings results and long story short, it was a really good quarter. The stock is still down 70% plus from its all time highs and so today I want to talk about whether SoFi stock is still a good buy following Q3 earnings. If you want to read the article version of this analysis, you can do so by finding the link to my article in the description box below. I don't want to waste any more of your time, so let's jump straight into the video. Looking at SoFi's Q3 results, Q3 revenue grew by 27% year over year to $537 million and adjusted revenue also grew by 27% to $531 million. And this was actually the 10th consecutive quarter where SoFi made record revenues, so that's really impressive. Yes, growth is slowing down as you can see right here, but SoFi continues to beat expectations which is just a testament to the company's value proposition and strong execution and this consistent strong growth was driven by record revenue across all three of SoFi's operating segments namely lending, technology platform and financial services. So here you can see revenue by segment its lending segment, which is SoFi's largest segment, grew 16% year-over-year in Q3 to $349 million, driven by higher loan balances as well as higher net interest margins, which was 5.99% for the quarter, up from 5.86% a year ago and 5.74% a quarter ago. Looking at loan originations, we can see that Q3 marks the first time in almost two years whereby all three of SoFi's lending segments grew year over year, so they're all back in the green now. Previously, personal loans drove all the growth in the lending segment while home loans and student loans volumes drop due to spiking mortgage rates and the student loan moratorium respectively. Home loans grew 64% to $356 million as the integration of Windham Capital Mortgage, which was acquired back in April this year, increased SoFi's fulfillment capacity for home loans. Personal loans, on the other hand, continues to grow rapidly despite being much larger than the other two segments, growing 38% year-over-year to $3.9 billion. And finally, student loans doubled year-over-year -year to $919 million as borrowers prepared for the resumption of student loan payments in October as the student loan moratorium expires. In total, Q3 loan originations grew 48% year-over-year to $5.2 billion, surpassing the $5 billion mark for the first time ever, so that's really good to see. Moving on to the next business segment, SoFi's tech platform, which consists of Galileo and Technesis, posted $90 million in Q3, up 6% year-over-year due to the additions of new clients and growth at existing clients. While growth looks really soft recently, management reiterated that tech platform revenue should accelerate in Q4 as clients continue to adopt products offered by Galileo and Technesis. And it's worth mentioning that SoFi is focusing on acquiring larger clients with established customer bases, stable revenue streams, and stronger growth potential. And this strategy is playing out really well with tech platform accounts growing 10% year over year to 137 million, despite losing a major customer in Q1 this year. More importantly, the segment maintains a robust deal pipeline with SoFi in RFP status or request for proposal status with a number of large financial institutions. The company also won a regional bank deal, so this strong deal pipeline should drive future growth for the tech platform segment. Turning to the financial services segment, Q3 revenue for the segment was $118 million, which is up 142% year over year its fifth consecutive quarter of triple digit growth. Growth for the segment was primarily due to three main reasons, member growth, product growth, and better monetization. Firstly, SoFi grew members by 47% in Q3 to 7 million members, adding 717,000 members, which is the highest new member ads in a single quarter. I think this is the most important number in the earnings report, the previous record was 584,000 new member ads in Q2 this year, so that 717,000 new member ads in Q3 alone is a really huge surprise for me and I think this is really bullish 
because new member ads is a leading indicator for future revenue growth. Secondly, SoFi grew total products by 45% in Q3 to 10.4 million. On a sequential basis, SoFi added over 1 million new products, which is the highest new product ads in a single quarter as well. So that again is very impressive. But adding a record number of products and members are meaningless if the company fails to monetize them. But fortunately, SoFi's overall monetization rates continue to improve as well with revenue per product up 61% to $53. With all that being said, SoFi as a whole is showing strong performance despite the challenging macro environment and tough year over year comes and CEO Anthony Noro echoes this by categorizing SoFi as a secular grower rather than a cyclical grower and that the company continues to steal market share from incumbents. In other words, SoFi is set to grow rapidly and take market share regardless of the market environment and with all three lending segments back in growth mode, I think the company will continue to break records over the next few quarters. Turning to profitability, overall contribution profit, which is net revenue minus direct expenses, was $239 million in Q3, representing a 45% contribution margin to adjusted revenue. These two metrics are the highest it has ever been, which shows economies of scale within SoFi's platform. If we break it down by segment, you can see that Q3 represents the first quarter ever where all three segments have positive contribution margins which is a major milestone for the SoFi team. Q3 lending contribution margin was 60% and while this is lower year over year as you can see right here, it is an improvement from Q2's 57% contribution margin and as the Windham Capital integration kicks in and as student loan payments resume, I won't be surprised if we see lending contribution margins return to the mid-60s level. Next, Q3 tech platform contribution margin was 36% which is a massive improvement year over year and quarter over quarter and before you get too excited, this was actually driven by a few one-time items that reduced direct expenses by 12% year over year. Moving forward, management expects contribution margins to be in the upper 20s to 30% in the near term, so expect margins to come down a little in future quarters. Lastly, Q3 financial services contribution margin was 3%, the first time ever that the segment turned profitable as you can see right here, driven by better monetization and increased operating leverage. Now with the high margin lending business back in full force, the tech platform margin bottoming in Q1 this year, and the financial services segment turning even more profitable with each passing quarter, I see a clear path for SoFi to produce overall contribution margins of at least 50% in 2024, so that's something to be excited about. Moving down the income statement, net income for the quarter was negative $267 million in Q3, which is a negative 50% net margin. That is not a typo, but fortunately, this drop in net income was due to a one-time non-cash goodwill impairment expense of $247 million. It wasn't clear what caused this goodwill impairment, but the important thing is that this is a one-time charge and without this one-time charge, net income in Q3 would have been negative $20 million, a sequential improvement from Q2's negative $48 million. Whatever it is, contribution profit is at an all-time high both in absolute and marginal terms, which reflects economies of scale and net income excluding goodwill impairment is trending in the right direction as well, reflecting operating leverage. In addition, management also reiterated that the company will be gap net income profitable in Q4 and in 2024, so that is great news for SoFi investors and I think that will be a major catalyst for the stock. Turning to the balance sheet, SoFi has cash and short-term investments of about $2.8 billion with $6.4 billion of total debt which puts its net cash position at about negative $3.6 billion. And as you can see, net cash position has been relatively flat over the last few quarters. Taking a closer look of its balance sheet, 
SoFi added a record $2.9 billion of deposits in Q3, which allowed SoFi to fund its loans at a relatively lower cost than using debt, leading to improved unit economics in the form of higher net interest margin. But the more important thing here is that total loans and deposits continue to expand which drive higher revenue potential while total debt dips slightly quarter over quarter which lowers SoFi's cost of capital which is great to see. And as of Q3, SoFi had $21.4 billion of total loans on its balance sheet with $15.7 billion of deposits. In terms of cash flow, it wouldn't be helpful to look at free cash flow since banks typically have negative operating cash flow due to increased lending. As such, we can look at SoFi's adjusted EBITDA as a proxy for cash flow. In Q3, SoFi produced record adjusted EBITDA of $98 million, representing an adjusted EBITDA margin of 18%. Q3 incremental adjusted EBITDA margin, which is the change in adjusted EBITDA divided by the change in revenue, was 48%, meaning for every additional $100 million of revenue that SoFi generates, the company subsequently produces $48 million of adjusted EBITDA. This means that SoFi could produce adjusted EBITDA margins as high as 40% plus in the future, which is huge. So all things considered, SoFi's balance sheet continues to expand and the company is essentially cash flow positive, which is great to see. Turning to the outlook, management provided the following guidance, but keep in mind that I will only be looking at the high end of its guidance since SoFi always beat their own guidance. As usual, management raised guidance once again. The company now expects $2.065 billion in adjusted net revenue in 2023, which is up 34% year over year, and this was raised by $29 million, which reflects strong demand. The company now expects full year adjusted EBITDA to be $396 million at a 19% adjusted EBITDA margin and a 48% incremental adjusted EBITDA margin. This was raised by $53 million dollars which means accelerated profitability and finally the company also expects gap net income profitability in q4 on another note ceo anthony noro also mentioned 500,000 plus new member ads per quarter up from its average of around 400,000, reflecting strong demand for sofi products in short the outlook looks bright as digital banking continues to gain traction and sofi continues to take market share from legacy banks moving on to valuation sofi trades at an ev to revenue multiple of just 5.6 times which is a significant discount from its highs of 39 times and nearly half its average of 11 times it is trading very close to its all-time lows of 4.9 times so on a historical basis sofi looks cheap this is justified given the macro environment today and its slowing top line growth, but I think SoFi deserves a higher multiple given its strong competitive positioning and financial performance. I've done a DCF analysis on SoFi as well, but do note that my model is oversimplified and does not include traditional DCF items such as networking capital, so just take it with a grain of salt. That's it, I've used adjusted EBITDA as a proxy for cash flow from operations. I will then subtract income taxes and capital expenditures to obtain a somewhat close estimate for free cash flow. With that out of the way, here are my key assumptions. For revenue growth, I will assign a 34% growth in full year 2023 as guided by management and then drop growth rates to just 28% in 2024, 22% in 2025 and eventually drop down to just 12% by 2032. I think this is reasonable given the multiple secular growth trends that SoFi is enjoying. For adjusted EBITDA, I will assign an adjusted EBITDA margin of 19% in full year 2023 as guided by management, but I expect margins to improve to 30% by 2025 and beyond as management is confident in achieving incremental adjusted EBITDA margins of 30% plus. Remember that SoFi currently has an incremental adjusted EBITDA margin of 48%. So it's possible that SoFi achieves a margin of 40% plus, but just to be conservative, I will use a 30% margin. For income tax, I will set it at 15% of adjusted EBITDA once SoFi turns gap net income profitable, which will be in 2024. And for capital expenditures, I will set it at its 3-year average, which is 5.2%. 
So based on all these assumptions, I expect SoFi to generate $9 billion of revenue by 2032 at a 20.3% cash flow margin. And based on a discount rate of 10% and a perpetual growth rate of 2.5%, I arrive at a fair value estimate of $13.22 for SoFi stock, which represents an upside potential of about 65% based on the current price of $8.01. In addition, my fair value estimate is much higher than the average analyst price target of $9.81 but still lower than the street high of about $15 a share. Whatever it is, SoFi has what it takes to be a top 10 bank which I think will drive meaningful share price appreciation for years to come. In the near term, Gap net income profitability in Q4 and a possible S&P 500 inclusion could be major catalysts for the stock as we've seen with other growth stocks such as Palantir. So to wrap up, Q3 was a massive win for SoFi. The company posted record revenue with all three business segments producing record results as well and all three of them are now profitable. I think this is a blowout quarter especially with the 717,000 net new member ads in a single quarter. Additionally, growth is set to reaccelerate with all three lending segments back in growth mode after a long time. The company is expected to turn profitable in Q4 and there's also the possibility of S&P 500 inclusion which could drive the stock much higher. The risk is that SoFi is politically driven so the stock will continue to be volatile and another major risk is SoFi missing estimates. I think investors have high expectations for SoFi heading into Q4 and if SoFi misses, the stock could sell off a lot. That said, the road to being a top 10 bank is well underway as evident from SoFi's record-breaking quarter. Valuation still looks very attractive which is why I'm considering starting a position in SoFi soon. But what about you? What do you think about SoFi stock? Please let me know in the comment section down below. Otherwise, that's all that I have for you today. If you like this type of content, please leave a like, comment, and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. As always, I appreciate you and I hope you have an amazing day. See you guys on the next video.